Well, um, I'm here to talk about popularity. And um, I'm going to ask you to think a little bit about uh, popularity today, how it's changed a little bit over time, and also to think a little bit about um, not only your kids' popularity, but perhaps your own popularity. And you know, I used to start this talk by um, asking people to raise their hands to a variety of different questions and get a little bit of a, a poll as to the popularity of the folks in the room back when you were in high school. And you know, I've come to think over time that I don't think that's entirely fair. Um, you know, you don't get to know anything about uh, about me, and and it's not fair to ask you to do something that I wouldn't do myself. So I think that I um, would like to share with you a photo and quiz you on whether you can, uh, how much you already know about adolescent popularity. Here it is. <laughs> now, just in case you don't know the answer, let me give you a couple of clues here. I was 17 years old when I took this picture, um, despite looking about 11. Uh, <laughs> people asked me if I was Doogie Howser for a number of years, and not. This uh, picture was taken in 1987 when it was already really uncool to have those glasses. <laughs> I was four feet nine inches tall at this point. And just, you know, the, the, the perfect topping for all of that is that I, at high school graduation, won an award <laughs> for having perfect attendance from the beginning of kindergarten all the way into the last day of my senior year. So. <laughs> <laughs> So obviously, I was the coolest kid in school. <laughs> you know, I want to talk a little bit about popularity because so many of us think about, even just hearing the word popular, that you know, this is an experience that really characterizes our lives in high school. And to some extent, we kind of forget a little bit not only how much popularity plays a role before high school, but we like to pretend that popularity might not be a thing anymore once we've left high school. In fact, some of us have spent a lot of time and energy trying to sweep all those memories under the rug and really think about our popularity as being, you know, really not a part of our adult lives whatsoever anymore. Now, I'd, I'd like to suggest that that's not true. And we might not call our social interactions popularity anymore, but whether we're thinking about our friends, our relationships, um, the people that we really look up to and uh, regard that we try to emulate, it really has a lot more to do with popularity than we might think. And one of the reasons why is based on some really brand new research that asks us to take a look back, but not just to look back at our own high school years, really a look back way earlier than that. Um, I'd like for a moment just to journey back about 60,000 years. Um, because research is really suggesting in so many ways that we didn't even know before that fundamentally we are a social species. We are a species that was built to care about popularity. And the extent to which coming here tonight you thought about your high school experiences or you have emotions just hearing the word popular and the extent to which we always feel a desire to want to be liked, want to be well regarded, um, want people to think highly of us, that's not just a coincidence. There's something very deep in our evolutionary roots that is perhaps the reason why popularity continues to be so important. So it turns out that, of course, 60,000 years ago, there were not just humans that we are today on the planet, but about four or five different species. And the reason why we survived against all odds, no one would have bet on us. We were smaller, we were weaker, we were less resilient against hardships and bad weather or food deprivation. No one would have thought that we would have survived. But the reason why we survived is because we learned how to become part of a herd. And our ability to be part of a herd and work together was absolutely the reason why we are here, sitting here today. Very much the fiber of our being, of our entire species' survival, is based on actually a small genetic mutation that allowed our larynx a slightly different shape. And with that shape, while all the other species had primitive sounding grunts, uh, we could go, uh, and <laughs> slightly use different sounds. That same genetic mutation also changed the development of a part of our brain that allowed us to understand the difference between one type of grunt and the other. And with the basis to communicate with one another, we became a social species. We were able to protect one another. We were able to 
um, work together, to hunt, to um, comfort one another when needed, to tell each other where we had hid weapons or how we can work together to uh, accomplish big tasks. But we were a social species that was nomadic. So it was very important for us to kind of work together and all do things at the same time. This is why we're so inclined to really copy others, whether we realize that we're doing it or not. You know, some theorists have suggested that it's this kind of herding instinct and this desire to be part of the group that's led to si signals that we can still identify today. Have you ever noticed that yawns are contagious? Have you ever heard the research that suggests that women's menstrual cycles might synchronize? All of these are based on the idea that there's some reason why we all needed to sleep at the same time, have sex at the same time, and give birth at the same time. It certainly isn't practical if we're a nomadic species to stop every time someone takes a nap. You know, you sleep, we all sleep, we're all gonna go at the same time. You know, in my head, all the prehistoric people talked like my Jewish grandma. <laughs> um, well, it turns out that there's now research that's telling us that the moment today that we feel socially excluded, there's a part of our brain that lights up and it sends us a very, very strong signal. The surprise is that the part of the brain that lights up is the same part of the brain that's activated when we experience physical pain. It's not the part of the brain that makes us feel a burning or a, or a, a throbbing sensation. It's the part of the brain that comes with it that tells you that whatever you're doing, stop. Do the opposite, you're in grave danger. And this makes sense. If you were kicked out of, the, if you stayed in the herd, it meant survival. If you were kicked out of the herd, it meant imminent death. So our brains tell us the moment that we experience exclusion, people disagree with us, or tell us that they're um, generally not feeling as close to us anymore. And when the brain does that, it sends a signal downstream and it actually changes our DNA. We are built with far more DNA than we actually need. We have a lot installed on the hard drive that hasn't been double-clicked yet and, and activated. It's just there waiting for a reason to be, uh, to be kind of expressed. The field of epigenetics has just recently demonstrated that the minute that we experience social rejection, dormant DNA in our bodies turns on. The DNA that turns on is actually to activate a pro-inflammation response to protect us from imminent bacterial infection and help us to uh, survive. Our bodies are so attuned to our popularity that to the very blueprint of our being, our experiences minute to minute, day to day, of social rejection versus inclusion literally changes the entire construction of our body in every single cell. We do this in my lab. We're able to look at adolescents before and after they experience a mock social stressor, and within 40 minutes, you can see different DNA activated in their bodies. So I would say that popularity is something that we actually do care about deeply, far more deeply and substantially than we ever realized before, and that's important. Because once we accept that fundamental premise, we can understand why it is that popularity may play such a remarkable role, not just for children and adolescents, but for decades and decades later. So I first began um, doing my work on popularity um, as a graduate student, of course, but in my first job at Yale University, um, I had the opportunity to teach a class. And you know, at Yale, they let you teach whatever class you want, and I decided to teach a class on popularity. The reason why I was so interested in doing so is because the research literature has shown us that there are actually two very different kinds of popularity, and most of us are searching for the wrong one. So I wanted to do this um, class at Yale and talk a little bit about the two different kinds of popularity. Well, at Yale, they don't have um, a course pre-registration system, so whoever signs up uh, whoever wants to show up on the first day of class, they automatically get in the class. So they assigned my, my class to a small room for about 35 students, and it was in a building uh, right in the center of campus. And I walked up to the building about you know, 10, 15 minutes early to get myself set up, and there were hordes of students that were standing outside the building, snaked from the room that I was assigned, little did I know, down the hallway, down the stairs, out the door, and surrounding the entire building like a mob. 
I had no idea what was going on. I assumed there was a fire, fire drill, so I kind of just hung out out there for a little while and started talking with the people and finally just asked them, like, yeah, I wonder when this drill is going to be over. We need to get in. Like, you know, I'm teaching a class. And, um, and they said, no, no, there's no fire drill. We just can't physically get into the building. We're all here for this class on popularity that this professor is teaching. It's like, oh my god, I'm that professor. Um, I, <laughs> I got to go. And <laughs> kind of went running up there. And you know, it was Yale. So a lot of the students that were there were the children of senators and governors. And um, there were a couple of movie stars in there. And the next thing you knew, um, this had started to get a little bit of media attention that one out of every 10 students on Yale's campus had registered and ultimately was in this class on popularity. And um, when the media contacted me, they wanted to do a news magazine, asked me if I would do a, uh, a show about popularity with them. And what they asked me to do was to focus specifically on these two different kinds. The reason why they were so interested in this was because people like me who are really interested in understanding how to predict which children will thrive and which children will suffer difficulties for the rest of their lives, um, had found something very startling. A lot of research had been done to try and identify all the factors that you might think of that predict success. Um, those factors included pretty much everything that our society focuses on as being important. Um, they looked at IQ as an important predictor. They looked at gender, race, and ethnicity. They looked at family income as a predictor of student success, years of students' education. They looked at histories of mental illness, not only for children themselves, but also mental illness that ran in their family tree. They looked at the uh, risk factor of physical illness on how well kids were able to thrive. They also looked at kids' substance use and their acting out behavior. What they found was that after controlling for all of these factors, there was one factor that played a role above and beyond everything. And ultimately, it was kids' popularity. When they looked at folks 20, 30, 40 years later, it didn't matter so much what their IQ was, what their mental health histories were. The kids that did the best as adults were popular, and the kids who did not were not. So the news magazine asked me, can you replicate an experiment that's been done to talk about the power of popularity? So I said, sure, let's give it a try. Let's talk about popularity at age three. So they set me up in a daycare center about an hour outside of Manhattan. And they asked me to go in and to see if I could measure the popularity of three-year-olds. And what they were interested in seeing was a classic study, uh, see if I can replicate it. Would there be a way, when kids are popular or not, is that really just based on which class they're in? Does it matter what school they're in? Maybe if you take a kid who's really popular and you move them to a different class or a different school, they get a fresh start. They can be popular or not popular all over again. Now, the research suggested that that might not be the case. So they asked me to replicate this. What we did was we were able to measure the popularity of each and every three-year-old simply by talking with all of the kids in the school one at a time. Now, popularity at age three is not based on how many Instagram followers they have. And it's not based on you know, whether they have kind of like a tricked out big wheel that they ride around the sandbox or anything. Popularity at age three is the same as one of the kinds of popularity that carries on all the way into adulthood and becomes especially relevant all over again in elderly retirement homes. Um, it's popularity that's based on likability. So we asked every kid there, tell me who are the kids that you like the most. Tell me who are the kids that you like the least. And of course, they couldn't read, so they simply looked at a picture. And they gave us that information. Which were the kids that were the most accepted? Which were the kids that were the most rejected? And everyone in between. And we were able to make an ordering of exactly how popular each kid was based on their likability. Then we scrambled all the kids. And because they were three, they didn't have any history with one another. This was the first year for daycare in that facility. So the kids who were accepted were suddenly hanging out with other kids they had never met before. The kids who were rejected were hanging out with a brand new batch of peers. And they asked us to come in week after week and to see whether these kids would again emerge as being popular, liked, or whether the new kids gave them a fresh start. Well, we played with those kids for a little while. And we were, in fact, able to replicate the research. It took under three hours. The kids who were the most likable 
became the most likable all over again with these brand new kids they had never met before. And the kids who were disliked immediately became disliked in a span of less than an afternoon. Of course, we and other researchers have been really interested in figuring out what makes somebody so likable so quickly. And what's fascinating for me is that the answer at three is the same as the answer at 23, 53, and 103. The people who are most likable are the ones who are not aggressive. They are the ones that listen. They don't speak up right away. They're good at waiting their turn, seeing what the social norms are, and entering and changing the group from within. They don't dominate. They make everyone feel valued. They make everyone feel welcome. They make everyone feel cared for. This is what it takes to be an extremely likable person at home, at work, at school, and especially in a retirement home. <laughs> um, so this is probably why when you look at those kids who are the most likable, we find that in adolescence, those who are the most likable are much happier than those who are not well-liked. It predicts years later the quality of friendships and romantic relationships in adolescence. Being very likable predicts school retention and grades quite strongly. It also predicts thriving in uh, giving back to the community, community service, volunteering, doing things that really help enrich the world around them. Likeability is a strong predictor of this in adolescence. Some research has followed folks out beyond adolescence. In fact, research has now looked at folks 20, 30, 40 years after they've left school. The results have been remarkable. Those who are most likable are more likely to get hired decades later. They're more likely to get promoted. They make more money. They also have better quality relationships. They, get, they have much higher marital satisfaction. They're more likely to stay together with their partner. And their children end up being more likable as, as well in some cases, um, but, always, but often um, more well-adjusted. They're less likely to suffer difficulties, and that gener next generation does better in their grades and in their happiness and in their confidence. And for reasons that I just mentioned, people who are more likable actually live longer. They have less diseases, and they have a longer lifespan because of that DNA effect that I mentioned before. Some research has looked at the effects of being popular, or I should say, excuse me, being unpopular on mortality rates. They've compared the mortality rate of being unpopular on your likelihood of death. They've looked at whether it was just as strong as the effect of obesity. If it was just as strong as the effect of physical, uh, lack of physical exercise, being unpopular beat them all. The only risk factor that is equal in strength on your life expectancy as unpopularity is the risks that come from heavy smoking. There's something about our popularity, at least our likability, that seems to be remarkably important over the decades. So a lot of people ask me, you know, how, how is that possible? How does that work? How could the way that you interact with kids in your grade or kids in your school, you know, how might that have this lifelong effect? And the answer is the remarkable cascade effects that come from being likable. Just to really briefly show you that, what we find is that those who are the most likable are invited to be a part of more activities. At the childhood level, we see that these are folks who are more likely to get invited to birthday parties and playdates and to be asked to um, volunteer for other kinds of clubs. Well, if you think about that, the three-year-old or the 13-year-old who gets those opportunities, every one of those experiences gives them the chance to learn a specific skill. When you go to a play date, you're learning more how to share, how to resolve conflicts, how to interact with a great deal of emotion that comes up while you're playing in a rambunctious way. With each of those opportunities, it leads to a skill. This also happens for adults. Every member in a, a company who is well-liked that gets invited to be on more teams, that gets invited to talk with people after work, they learn more about the corporate politics. They learn more about the things that play a role in that workplace environment. And with every of those opportunities, they gain more skills. 
Well, those skills lead them to become more likable. That child who knows how to share and emotionally regulate and interact with their peers is all the more likable as a result. And this begins to snowball over years and years and years. This is why these kids do so, so well. The kids who are not very well liked, they are not only not getting the opportunity to go to the average number of playdates or birthday parties, they're actually deprived and they're getting less opportunities. So when everyone else has learned what to do if you get two conflicting birthday parties or how to handle a situation when two people want you to play at once, these kids unfortunately have never gotten that opportunity. So when the time comes for them to use that skill, they don't have it. That makes them only more disliked and their spiral is unfortunately much sadder. You know, I was really interested in just exactly how that might work. So what I did was in my class over the years, I've designed an experiment that we do. I want to see whether we can understand that cascading effect that might happen in a single day. Could we change people's experiences with popularity? And could we fundamentally change the way that they interact with people just with one tiny manipulation? So what we did was we asked everyone in the class to design a t-shirt. We wanted it to be a loud, ridiculous, tongue-in-cheek t-shirt. So we picked a color that hurts your eyes if you look at it with the sun reflecting off of it. We picked a saying that the kids picked that they thought would get them a lot of attention on campus, and people would find it funny and tongue-in-cheek. In this uh, last time that we did it, we used this particular one, which DJ Khaled um, kind of references him. But in other years, we've picked other kinds of t-shirts that I'm the most awesome, I'm so popular, which everyone realizes is a, a big joke. Now, UNC Chapel Hill, in particular, is 14,000 students. And when a few hundred people are all wearing the same very, very bright t-shirt, we can guarantee that they are going to be treated differently for a day. And that's what we wanted to see. What happens if for a single day, you are getting a different kind of attention? Well, we all know that if the environment treats you in a certain way, it's going to affect you. It's going to affect your mood. It's going to affect how you feel about yourself. If someone cuts you off in traffic, you might not be feeling very good about things or about the world you know, as you pull into your parking spot. That's not what we are interested in looking at. What we are interested in looking at is how, when the environment changes you, how does that elicit new behaviors and feelings back out of you to change the environment reciprocally? So what we did is we asked these kids to keep track of exactly what they thought, what they felt, what experiences they had, what social kinds of interactions occurred on a regular day when they wore just their regular ordinary t-shirts. And then all of us, myself included, wore the very loud, obnoxious, tongue-in-cheek t-shirt on campus and got lots of attention. People come running up to us, ask us, what's that for? Oh, that's kind of funny. Um, and they get a lot of attention. And sure enough, when students in my class are asked to write about it, they say, yes, more people came and talked to me. People were nice to me. People joked with me. In other words, people treated them as if they were pretty likable. The thing that was surprising is how much kids said, I can't believe how much just that little bit of a change in how the environment treated me changed me. The kids who spent all day walking across campus staring down at their phones looked up, waved, said hello to people, met strangers. The people who were in classes and never raised their hand would raise their hand. They felt smarter. They felt more competent. They felt bolder. Kids told me that they ended up asking out people they had crushes on for weeks. They made friendships. They exchanged more social media information with one another. And those relationships lasted for weeks and months after the experiment. They told me that simply being treated so nicely for a day brought out a side of them that they had never seen before. When that happened, the environment met them where they were. As they were more bold and happy, people treated them more hap happily and with more energy and enthusiasm. And it spiraled for them in just the course of one day. One of the kids said, if I wore that t-shirt, metaphorically, every day from my childhood, I would be a completely different human being today. And you know something? He's right. That's what the research is telling us. Unfortunately, everything changes once kids reach adolescence. And that's because of something that seems to occur inside adolescents' brains. So you might know, of course, that when adolescents mature, they mature one kind of piece at a time. And one of the things that happens way before you hear any voices crack 
or you see any acne or anyone starts feeling awkward is something that's occurring in the brain. The adolescent brain is maturing in a way that makes them able to engage in adult-like thought. It's the brain that we all live with for the rest of our lives. But that adolescent brain actually changes one brain region at a time. And the brain region that uh, changes almost first is a region that gives us a big rush of rewards. And the rewards that we get are the same kinds of rewards, they're from dopamine receptors, that we would get when we experience the pleasure that might come from, let's say, recreational drug use. So yes, these rewards are addictive, hard to resist, and they're powerful. Well, it turns out that in an effort to try and make sure that all adolescents will one day move out of their parents' houses and not come back and live in the attic forever, our brains are designed to make us get a lot of rewards when we spend time with peers and to biologically be programmed to think that our parents became totally lame as soon as we hit 12 years old. That's how our brains are organized. Well, the things that give us rewards when we're hanging out with our peers are the same exact things that give rewards to other mammalian species. In fact, this is a part of the brain that we share with most other mammals, and it's below the part of the brain that we think of as being uniquely human. Um, if you're interested, it's called the ventral striatum. And what it does at the moment of puberty is it makes us want to seek that experience of being highly visible, of seeming powerful, of seeming alpha, of having people want to copy us and follow us. And yes, just like other species, we may be tempted to act aggressively just to get that kind of attention and power. That's what popularity is about in adolescence. That kind of popularity is not at all based on likability. In fact, it's based on status. And for most kids who are high in status, they happen to also be low in likability. Aggressive behavior will make you very disliked, but aggressive behavior is actually quite successful in making you higher in status. So suddenly we see a very brand new type of popularity emerge. And when you talk with adolescents, they'll say to you, I don't know why you're defining popularity as being who we like. That has nothing to do with who's cool and who's popular and who gets the most attention in high school. That is a completely different thing. So it's true. Research has now looked specifically at those who are rated as being higher or lower in status, and the correspondence with likability is actually quite small. So what happens to those who are high in status? Do they enjoy all of the benefits that we saw with all of the kids who were really likable? Well, if anyone's been to their high school reunion, they probably know of the myths, the adage that they peaked too soon. They didn't do as well. They were the kids who ended up staying in the same place where they grew up with the same friends, and they really never made very much out of themselves. Is that true? Is it really the case that high status leads to difficulties? Well, the answer is yes. Research has now been able to follow those who are high status well into adulthood. And what they find is that those who have the highest status and are not likable, they tend to be more likely to be in transient romantic relationships. They're anxious, they're depressed, they're much more likely to suffer from addictions, they don't hold on to jobs quite as long, they're less likely to get promoted and to have stable uh, jobs, and um, they tend to have difficulties raising their children. The people that are high in status have been given feedback in childhood that tells them that aggression, bullying, being domineering, and seeking status will lead to short-term rewards. Because frankly, much like other animal species, it does. Sadly, those who are aggressive and domineering do get more attention. They do temporarily get more power. And also quite temporarily, they do have more influence. What happens in studies where people have looked at those folks who were high in status and, sees, and saw what happened to them a little bit later on is that they found that these folks have continued to believe that those same dynamics are what works all throughout their adulthood. When they're broken up with, they report, the reason why I was broken up with was I wasn't popular enough. I was not as high status as I need to be. If I was higher in status, I'd be able to keep somebody. 
The reason why they don't do well in their jobs is because they're never satisfied with going high enough. They have to have higher and higher and higher status. And they have to get constant reminders of that status. And let's face it, seeking status is a way of putting your happiness into someone else's hands, saying the only way that I will feel good is if everyone else constantly tells me that I am high in status according to them. And it's about comparing yourself to others constantly. No one ever became happy by comparing themselves to others. This is cyclical. And when researchers would ask folks to bring in a romantic partner and a best friend, those kids who were formerly very high in status, and say to them, tell us um, how you're, it's going in those relationships, the high status kids, now adults, would say, it's great. These are great relationships. But the partners would say, I'm not liking this relationship. This is one of my worst friendships. They're not close. They stay superficial. All they're concerned about is using me as a way of elevating their status. And that's what the romantic partners say as well. This is similar but slightly different than what we hear about when we talk with celebrities. One of the things that I did also in working on this book was to look at those who are high in status in this more global way. Um, not just those who are celebrities, but looking at CEOs, looking at um, uh, politicians, sports heroes. And when you talk with them, what you find is that you get a remarkably similar story all the time. Even this level of high status is related to loneliness, depression, and a feeling that they desperately wish that they had others close to them. Long story short, the research generally seems to suggest with these types of high status people um, that there's a desire for people to interact with them but they need to set up a wall, a way of interacting with people that maintains their status, their reputation. But the only way to do that is to close their real self off, and they split. They have their public persona and their private persona. And while more and more and more people love that public persona, fewer actually know that the person that they are inside. And it makes them feel quite alone and distanced from others. And they trust fewer and fewer people, so they don't let many others in. And this is the same thing we hear over and over in a large scale, like a celebrity, as well in a, a much smaller scale um, when talking with CEOs, who tend to suffer from depression at a far higher rate than is seen in the general population. Here's why this concerns me now more than 20 years ago when I first started doing this kind of research. We have now entered a society where it seems like status is starting to rule. It wasn't that way all the time. It used to be that we were a culture that valued likability. We really fostered and taught our kids to care about connection, making actual relationships with one another. But actually, in the process of working on this book, I was with my daughter. My kids are seven and five now, but they were a couple of years younger when I was working on this particular section of the book. And my daughter was obsessed with Frozen because, you know, that's what four and five-year-old girls are obsessed with. So while I was in the supermarket looking for a Frozen magazine, I found one, and it was right next to this issue of Tiger Beat magazine, which I was not a reader of when I was a teenager. Um, so I was particularly curious to take a look at it, particularly because it had this particular headline, which it turns out was not unique to this issue or this publication at all. How you can be social media famous. And in the magazine, there was article after article explaining to adolescents that each individual person profiled used to be sad, insecure, wishing that they had more friends. But now, with 2 million followers, they were happy and successful, and all of the ails of adolescence were gone. And each person was profiled with a photo, usually a selfie, and a list of the number of their followers, communicating not implicitly, but quite explicitly, that their value as a contributor to society could be measured in retweets and in Instagram likes. There was a very clear set of instructions telling kids that this was not merely a hobby, but it was actually a career. They should hire publicists. They should talk with others about how to increase their profile. And to do so, they should tag and comment as disingenuously as possible to make sure that others would simply follow them, regardless of whether they believed in them or in the quality of what they said. This petrifies me, because we know that those who are high in status are likely to experience difficulties, 
but most of the world is giving kids a message right now that says, this is what you should be going for. And it's not just this magazine. I was surprised to find that adult magazines are doing the same. Photography magazines talked about the best ways to capture a selfie. CoverGirl has now issued a line of makeup that's designed to help you look best in selfie photos specifically. The Russian government, among other things, had to put out a public warning because there were so many selfie-related deaths that they needed to put out precautions about safe and unsafe ways to take your selfies. Magazines talked about how to take pictures of your dinner plate in a way that would be most likely to get as many possible likes on Instagram as possible. And this was sent to adults. This was in an adult magazine. Um, our world has become one where social media has really become a way of us quantifying popularity like we've never seen before. And to be clear, it's not that social media is necessarily a problem. Social media does a lot of amazing things. It gives lonely kids an opportunity to get support and, and companionship from folks um, when they don't have that in their offline worlds. It's a place where we can get instant social um, support and aid when we're feeling down about something. It's actually also quite good at developing self-presentation skills. Um, there are a lot of good things about social media. It's important that we recognize that these platforms were not designed specifically for those purposes in mind. They are, in fact, quite addictive as ways to get you to seek likes. This is important for adolescents. Facebook is so totally 2016, but 71% of adolescents still are on Facebook. Over 80% of adolescents are on social media. And here's the part that I think is important. Only 60% of parents ever check their uh, kids' profiles on any of these social media sites. And by the way, a lot of kids have a private site they don't tell their parents about either. So this number is probably an overestimate. There's been research from this same fact tank, the Pew Research Center, that's talked about how much uh, parents talk with their kids about their offline social lives. The number is very high. But only one third of parents ever talk with their kids about what their lives are like online and what their social media experiences are. And let me tell you, from our research lab, we have looked year after year at how many of kids' peer experiences are occurring voice to voice or face to face, and how many of them are electronically mediated. Those numbers have been changing with every year. At our last assessment, kids are telling us that 70% of their interactions with their peers are happening electronically. There are rarely offline peer interactions anymore. We're missing 70% of their peer experiences when we're not talking with them about this. Here's why this scares me even more. There's now been research to look at what happens in adolescents' brains while they are on social media by literally having kids go in an fMRI while looking at Instagram. What they found was, as I mentioned before, there are two different parts of the brain, excuse me, one part that really lights up to give us a sense of pleasure and reward. And that part draws us in, tells us to do more of those kinds of activities. But there's another part. It develops a little bit later in adolescence. It's the prefrontal cortex. And that part of the brain is the brakes. It inhibits all of our urges and tells us, do not follow through with whatever you're thinking about. Stop immediately. Well, what they found was that when they showed kids images in the scanner, as you might hope, when Kids looked at something cute and adorable and nice. They found that the part of the brain that lights up is the part that is the approach center, saying you can engage in more of this, be interested in this, find this to be something positive that you approve of. When you show kids pictures of something dangerous, illegal, immoral, um, life-threatening, what you found is that there was instead a lighting up of that inhibition center, the front of the brain saying, do not do this. You should be against this. This is really good news. This is an example of everything that we've taught kids working beautifully. But then they showed kids these same pictures in counterbalanced order, and they attached to it metrics that indicated that on social media, these photos had been liked very much or retweeted. As soon as they did that, the inhibition center of the brain shut off. 
Once kids saw dangerous, immoral, illegal, risky acts coupled with indicators that they were popular on social media, it changed their values. It undid everything that we've tried to teach them. It told them that if everyone else likes this, maybe you don't have to inhibit. And what they found was that kids' values changed. These are the same processes that were used within our election cycle, but they're now being used to exploit our adolescents and change their value system based on what seems to be popular and what seems not. And the scary part of this is that most of this is occurring at regions in the brain that are beyond our conscious awareness. So this is happening all the time. and We have no idea that it's even happening to us. I should mention that this is not just about teens. Adults use a lot of social media as well, and these things are also occurring in the same way. And many of us are susceptible to the same kinds of traps, the same ways that we are lured towards what seems popular, and we are pushed to kind of seek our own level of popularity, even on social media. I can tell you that I myself, even after having written this entire book, found how easy it is to get sucked in. And it was specifically while I was asked by the publicist for this book to say, who told me, you need to up your social media profile. So I want you to start tweeting a lot. OK, that's odd. That's exactly what I don't think is the best idea. But I believe that there's a way to use social media responsibly, to make actual relationships, to recognize that there are human beings on the other ends of those mouse clicks. And if there's a way of actually learning about others and collaborating, and caring about the people that you're interacting with, then social media can be great. So there I was, tweeting away. And sure enough, a famous celebrity followed me with millions of followers. And here I have in one ear my publicist telling me, you want to get a lot of followers. You want to make sure that people all know about your book that's about to come out. So there I was, just seeing that some celebrity followed me with millions of followers. And it happened to me too. I started thinking, I wonder what I could post that I know that person would approve of. And then maybe they would retweet that post. And then all the people that they retweeted that post to, then they would start to follow me. And I thought, oh my god, I'm doing it. I'm getting sucked in just like everybody else. You start to get so addicted to the idea. In this case, it was quite instrumental. But I could feel that sensation of, wow, imagine that this many followers kind of started to, to follow me. And, and then everything that I said would be noticed by all these people. And I could start to inject my opinions into national debates. And people would retweet those. And it is addictive. It is hard. All of us have posted something on Facebook and had a lot of friends like it. And we, we know. It, it gives you that momentary feeling of like, oh, wow, lots of, lots of people clicked that one. They all saw me. They all approved of that. That makes me feel good. That's dangerous. And we never had a mechanism that allowed us to access that 24-7 before. A few things that I'll end with about what you can do. First, I think it's really important to recognize that the person that you were back in adolescence as a parent is still affecting you today. The reason why is because that development of our adult brain that was occurring when we were adolescents use those formative experiences with popularity to serve as a filter or a template. It changed the way that we interacted with people from then on. And the, that filter or template is continuing to influence the way that you see every social interaction every minute of every day. I'm going to show you a little bit how that is. Here is a very brief video with three circles and a box. That's it. I've shown this video to thousands and thousands of people and collected the responses and asked them very simply, what happened in this video? Nobody tells me that it was a video about three circles and a box. Everyone immediately anthropomorphizes those circles. And the things that they see, the ways in which they take this very simple piece of social information filter it through their own prior experiences and retell what it is that they think they just saw, it turns out is a bit revealing of their own high school popularity experiences. Some people have said, looks like they're having fun. This is a game. Some people have said, the other two are dis and blue. What's going on? He got left out. Some say they're playing tag. 
Some say they're blinded by rage. <laughs> One told me, blue is a narcissistic lover. <laughs> and another said, it looks like they're having a tickle fight. I see responses across the entire spectrum. People who see this as a very, very aggressive interaction and people who see this as a very playful, fun interaction. It turns out that those people who had difficulties with popularity in high school are more, any difficulties at all, will see it increasingly aggressive, more aggressive, extremely aggressive, depending on how much rejection they may have experienced. The people who do not experience a lot of rejection will see this as a much more positive or benign interaction. Well, it doesn't matter what you see on this video, you'll probably never see it again. But what does matter is that there's research that says that the ways that you interpret social interactions are changing the interactions you're having as a parent with your child and how you're coaching your child in their peer interactions. Moms and dads who see hostility in interactions are more likely to jump in and try and break up fights that are not necessarily even happening, and also things much more subtle than that. And similarly, moms that never, and dads that never see any kind of aggression are, have a blind spot to see when their child really is being rejected or at risk, and they don't know how to teach their child to ward off against that. So the first piece is to really just own our own experiences as adolescents and recognize that indeed those are still affecting the way that we see the world. The second thing that I would suggest is to think about the ways that we might accidentally be at reinforcing status over likability. Is it the case that we get very excited when we hear that our child was invited to the most number of parties, or they got asked to the prom by the most number of people? When we hear that others are all trying to emulate and copy our child, that's okay. It's okay to feel proud of those moments once in a while, but when we say that out loud, or when we actually encourage our children to try and get more of those outcomes, we're sending a very clear message that they should care about status, that that's the kind of popularity that will make them approved in your eyes, and that that's something that you think as an adult is an important kind of popularity that people should have growing up as well. Unfortunately, that might be part of the ways that we can help. Because if we instead ask our children every day when they came home, tell me about something you did today that made someone else feel included. Tell me about how you made other people feel good today. Tell me how you helped kids who might have been experiencing difficulties. Then we are teaching them how to engage in the behaviors and we're rewarding those instincts that will make them more likable. And likable will lead to a much better life. The third thing that we might do is recognize that these kids that are on social media, they still are children. And they, may, they are living in a world where social media never uh, has always existed. Whereas for us, this is all new. And we're just racing to catch up with it. By the time we learn what's going on on one platform, that's the uncool one, they're all on another platform that we don't even understand. But what's happening is that we need to talk with kids about social media as if it's real, because it is for them. This is the way they're interacting in what for them feels like the most important and rewarding relationships at this particular time in their lives. And we need to help them understand that what's happening online might not be what's happening offline at all. These are curated images. These are posts that are the ways that people are presenting themselves to the world that may or may not match reality whatsoever when folks are offline. We also need to help kids remember that their offline experiences are not merely fodder to increase their online presence. Some kids feel that an interaction with a friend only counts if they can take a selfie of it, post it online, and say, I'm such close friends with this person, I want everyone to see that. It's almost like those offline interactions have become instrumental rather than genuine as an opportunity to connect. And that's another opportunity where we can really talk with kids about social media. Ask them, what do you think would happen if someone posted a picture of cocaine on their feed? What would people say? What would they actually mean? Do you think that would be true? Do you think that people would approve of that? Start hearing their world through the ways that they're seeing it. And last, I would say that the other thing that we can do is just some good old fashioned kind of remembering to teach our kids empathy. Because empathy and compassion and being connected to one another those are the antidote to aggression. 
It is impossible to be aggressive and empathic at the exact same time. And if we are teaching our kids to really think about empathy and really how they can care for others, be sensitive towards others, and recognize how hard it is when others are made to feel lower in status, then we might be teaching kids how to live in the kind of society that we used to have and the one that I think we would all really like to be in, where we, we reward compassion and connection and true caring for one another. Ultimately, that's not only something that we can like, but it's something that makes us very likable as well. And it turns out that's the kind of popularity that matters. So thank you. <laughs>